So coming up on 11 o'clock, so I think I'll probably get started. Looks like there's a few more people joining from the waiting room, but um, I think it's probably reasonable to get started because we've got a lot to make it through. Um, so thank you everyone for coming to what I think is our last grand rounds of the academic year. Um, so thank you for making it out and for going this beautiful day <laughs> to listen in. Uh, my name is Danielle. For those that don't know me, I'm one of the PGY3s in the FR, uh, the Royal College Emerge program here in London. And uh, really excited to be here today to talk to you about trach related emergencies. So these are emergencies in patients who have pre existing tracheostomies uh, or laryn uh, laryngectomies. So the title of the talk is Trach It Till You Make It. And that's, I think, the attitude that some of us have a bit of apprehension when we see patients coming uh, with a trach. And hopefully we can alleviate some of that today. I want to start off by saying, a uh, resounding thank you uh, to those who made this talk possible and uh, provided their guidance and wisdom. Uh, so to our own uh, Dr. Luckett uh, Gatopoulos, who is listening in from <laughs> Matt Peets, uh, to Dr. Roth from ENT, and then to two of our RT colleagues, Justine and Emrita, who are kind enough to provide expertise and some resources as well. So thank you uh, for your input and thank you as well to Dr. Roth and Dr. Luckett who are on the line and uh, happy to help answer questions as we go along. I have no financial disclosures uh, or conflicts of interest to disclose uh, on this topic. And so the overview of what I want to cover today is I want to chat about trachs. Um, obviously, you know, it's a broad topic, so we'll focus on a few specific emergencies. We'll start with a little bit of history, actually. It's something I came across while I was preparing this talk, which I thought was quite fascinating. Uh, we'll move on to anatomy of a tracheostomy, both the anatomy within the human body, but also the uh, parts of a tracheostomy tube itself. We'll talk a little bit about trachs at LHSC, what you can expect to see, and then we'll talk about a common approach to a patient with a tracheostomy and finish up talking about specific complications, uh, both emergent and urgent complications. My objectives for today is that I hope everyone can leave here with a basic approach to a patient presenting with tracheostomy, what relevant history to collect uh, from that patient before you manage them, and then hopefully we'll develop an approach to managing emergent complications, specifically uh, decannulation, obstruction, and bleeding. So jumping into it, um, I thought it was very interesting that the first uh, possible depiction of tracheostomy was actually ancient Egypt. Um, these slabs were thought to maybe uh, represent tracheostomy, although the, uh, the scholarly debate wonders whether this might be ritual sacrifice as well. So I'll leave you to be the judge of that, but certainly a longstanding uh, potential uh, intervention. Uh, moving forward in history, um, Alexander the Great in 1000 BC was uh, described by Homer as having opened the airway of one of his soldiers with his sword when the soldier was choking on a fishbone. And so, uh, while I'm sure his sterile technique would not, would maybe be frowned upon by our surgical colleagues, um, again, that concept of accessing the airway from the anterior neck uh, is gaining prominence. Further into his, further moving forward in history, uh, Hippocrates, I think we all know and well, know well and love. Uh, we don't use this shoulder reduction technique any longer. However, uh, we're still taking his oath. He was a big uh, opponent to the tracheostomy actually. He said, don't do it. He was worried about the carotid artery. And so about 2000 years passed until the first successful tracheostomy in 1546. However, it was still quite frowned upon and it wasn't until uh, the 1800s, 1900s that we started to see it gaining prominence. I think we've seen a lot recently about uh, American presidents weighing in on medical care and uh, George Washington actually, who died in 1799, um, we think retrospectively from a combination of epiglottitis um, and some, some of the medical interventions used to save him, but one of his junior doctors actually suggests that to uh, bypass his upper airway obstruction, a tracheostomy might be reasonable. Unfortunately, he was uh, asked to leave the room and poo-pooed by the more senior physicians on the team who ultimately went with the treatment du jour of uh, bloodletting. And so unfortunately, George Washington died of a combination of upper airway obstruction and anemia. I think we're living in a time where we see how uh, the incredible ability for diseases, especially infectious diseases, to guide management. And so diphtheria rose to prominence in the 19th century and was a uh, treatment, or was a uh, disease really handmade for the tracheostomy. With that upper, we know that we can have these pseudomembranes or upper airway obstructions. Um, that are certainly amenable to bypass with surgical interventions. And so in the late 1800s and early 1900s, tracheostomy gained prominence, gained acceptance. And certainly in that time period, we started to trade for elective surgical procedures. So general anesthetics for other reasons would receive a tracheostomy. Um, and it wasn't until 1921 when uh, Dr. Robotham, not, not ours, of, of course, 
and a Dr. McGill, like the forceps, uh, published on the endotracheal tube, and this became the more popular uh, modality for general anesthetics. Polio rose to prominence in the early, early 20th century, and this again changed the use uh, for tracheostomy, and we began to use it much more for pulmonary toileting and for chronic ventilation, and this was the era of the iron lung, which you can see in the photo there. And so we see the start of that transition to the new and predominant use of tracheostomy for mechanical ventilation. And so moving closer to present day, in 2002, uh, an article published in the Journal of Otolaryngology looked at the indications for tracheostomy um, in the previous 10 years, and they looked at about a thousand trachs that occurred, and about 900 of those were to assist with mechanical ventilation, and about 100 to 150 of those were as an adjunct to head or neck surgery, or to relieve upper airway obstruction. So we see a big shift in the use of tracheostomy. Again, moving more uh, towards the future, uh, this is a study in the Journal of Critical Care Medicine in 2005, which was projecting the number of ventilated patients in Ontario, actually, uh, right out to 2026, which is looking closer and closer <laughs> this year. Um, and they were expecting, even with their most conservative estimates, which is the lower uh, dotted line there, an 80% increase from 2000 to 2026. Along the same lines, uh, in the same journal in 2004, this was a retrospective review looking at numbers of trached patients, and those uh, gray bars represent an increasing number of trached patients. And in that same study, uh, decreasing in-hospital mortality for patients with trachs. And so if we put all of this together, we can see that more patients are requiring ventilation, more of those ventilated patients are getting trachs, and fewer of those patients are dying in hospital. And therefore, I think we can extrapolate and expect to see more and more patients being discharged home to supported living, to nursing care, uh, with tracheostomies in situ, and we certainly can expect to see more of those patients coming to our emergency departments. Um, so I hope I've made the case that this is a really relevant topic for us to discuss today. Moving forward, we'll talk a little bit about the anatomy of a tracheostomy. So uh, you'll see in the uh, cross-sectional photo here that a, uh, let me see if I can point. There we go. Uh, so a tracheostomy sits in the anterior neck, typically is gonna be between the second and third or the third and fourth tracheal rings. Um, and you can get a good sense from this cross-sectional photo as to why it's a good intervention for those upper airway obstructions. Certainly you can see that anything happening in the upper airway, be it infectious, be it malignancy, be it congenital abnormality, we're bypassing that essentially and getting direct access uh, to the trachea and to the lungs. When we look at the anterior neck, we can rec recognize and I think respect that there's a ton of anatomy here. There's a number of structures that can be damaged that are adjacent to a tracheostomy. Um, that can be eroded into. And so I hope it sort of gives us a good respect uh, that tracheostomies certainly have potential to uh, present emergently. Um, this also gives us um, some good visual um, understanding as to why when we're criking or in an emergent uh, trach scenario, we approach with a vertical incision rather than a horizontal incision. And that's certainly to avoid some of this vascularity and hopefully make a uh, cleaner and more bloodless field. When we talk about a trach tube itself, um, pretty standard features in most trach tubes are going to be this flange that lies adjacent to the neck with the outer cannula passing through it. Um, this is the part that's in contact with the patient's stoma. This outer cannula may have a cuff or may not, depending on the trach. If there is a cuff, um, it'll have this uh, pilot balloon for inflation. Some trachs will have an inner cannula that snaps in to the outer cannula like so. Um, some of these are disposable, some are reusable, but the intention is they can be removed for cleaning. And then trachs come with an obturator that's used for inserting or reinserting them. So this won't be, the obturator won't be in place when the patient presents, but the patient may have that with them or we may need to obtain that. Here at LHSC, uh, we'll typically see two types of trachs. The first is uh, a Shiley on the left and the second is Bavona. There's certainly a lot of variation on this theme um, and within each, within Shiley and Bavona, there are different traits with different features. I think more commonly coming to the emergency department, we're gonna see Shiley traits. These are traits that have a disposable, or sorry, a removable inner cannula. Some are disposable and some aren't. But ultimately these are, these are patients who are likely to have a tracheo, tracheostomy in situ for a prolonged period of time and need that removable inner cannula for toileting. Bavona trachs tend to be used a bit more commonly by our ICU colleagues and patients who are chronically ventilated, um, but have, are anticipated to be uh, decannulated at some point. So our patients who are coming in are most likely to have these Shiley trachs, which again, may or may not be cuffed, and this inner cannula may or may not be disposable. 
but just to familiarize you with sort of the two traits that you may expect to see at LHSC, depending where you are. Um, this was brought to my attention by the RTs and certainly some excellent resources are available on our intranet if you are looking for them. So if you go to the basic desktop site and you click programs and services, uh, you go to the respiratory therapy tab, to the adult tab and you choose tracheostomy management. It is a few clicks, unfortunately, uh, but we do have this long list of policies for here at LHSC. There's a tube change policy that will walk you through um, the exact process of a tube change. Not that it's something we'll be doing routinely, but if it's something you're interested in, they've got uh, a nice chart that shows you equivalent sizes because unfortunately the different brands of tracheostomy don't uh, have equivalent sizing. It's got the checklist for what's in the trach change box. And so this is a box that our RT colleagues have in their department in the ICU, and there's one down in Emerge. And so it's always a good th thing to ask them to bring when you call for their assistance. And so the checklist for what's in there is actually posted um, to give you a good sense of the types of equipment that you may need. And like I said, there's the tube change policy, cup inflation policy, and any number of other policies. So I wanna start moving into the clinical part of this talk now that we've got some basics down and I wanna frame it with a bit of a case. And so this is Fred. Uh, Fred's a 54 year old gentleman uh, who has ALS and who's now chronically ventilated via tracheostomy. He's an otherwise healthy uh, 54 year old and he comes from home complaining of a small volume bright red blood from his trach site for the last two days with his uh, toileting. Today he's here in Emerge because they think that the trach is blocked um, or at least partially blocked and they're having difficulty clearing it with their home suction and toileting. So they've come to the emergency department and we'll uh, manage him near the end, but I just wanted to give us a case to think about uh, as we move forward. So we'll talk now about a basic approach uh, to a patient with a tracheostomy. And I think there's sort of five big historical points beyond your history and you know, your history of presenting illness and your past medical history that I think it's important to elicit early in your management of these patients. And the first is, why did they get a tracheostomy? And we'll talk a little bit later about why this is so, so important. Um, but what's really important to know is, is this a tracheostomy for chronic mechanical ventilation, where we can assume that the upper airway may be patent, or is this a trach um, performed because the patient needs to bypass an obstruction in the upper airway? So they may have a malignancy, like I said, infectious congenital, obstruction in the upper airway, or they may have had a laryngectomy and have no patent passageway between their upper, uh, their oropharynx, nasopharynx, and their trachea. So really important to elicit that to get a sense as to how we're going to manage patients down the road. The second question to ask is how old is that tracheostomy? And the big divider would be seven days. So is it an immature trach, meaning that it's less than seven days old, or is it a mature trach that's more than seven days old, um, and that will be a big divider when we talk later about managing some of these patients. I think, and certainly in speaking to, our, to Dr. Roth and our ENT colleagues, it would be unlikely for us to see an immature trach presenting to the emergency department, but uh, certainly something to keep in mind uh, on the off chance that you do see one. The second question, or the third question rather, would be what type of tracheostomy? Um, so again, and this goes into the fourth question, which is, is it cuffed or not? But, you know, is it a Shiley? Is it a Bavona? what size is the trach, why was it placed, um, important things to elicit. And then finally, what previous complications or instrumentation have they had? So have they had bleeding before? Have they had infectious complications? Which will help you to frame your differential diagnosis for these issues. So preparing to see these patients, um, let me just take a glance at who's on the line. Sid. Um, so EMS has patched in and they say they have a patient coming in uh, with a trach in situ who's having uh, shortness of, you know, shortness of breath. Um, what sorts of equipment would you want available and where are you going to see this patient? So um, I would likely be seeing this patient in a, like an acute uh, care area, whether it's like um, a recess or more of a, um, just a better equipped uh, general like front bubble kind of uh, blue, t blue bed. Um, realistically, I'd also be asking or calling for RT to have them uh, available to help as well, just because obviously they deal with these a lot more frequently than we do. Um, and then you had mentioned a, a trach change box. So I, I would see if we could locate that if that exists. Um, 
have kind of suction, I'd have some other um, airway adjuncts. So whether it's like uh, a bougie or just even like a smaller size endotracheal tube, uh, if there's some concern that we may actually need to exchange it and don't have like a replacement trach or um, whatnot. Um, and then that would be kind of like my, and then I would obviously hopefully be getting the patient information to get some um, understanding about them as a, an actual patient, hopefully before they arrive as far as what, uh, as you've already said, like why they have a, the trach in the first place. Um, and then plus or minus like vent setup or whatever, depending on the uh, severity of the um, shortness of breath. Great. Thanks, Sid. I appreciate that. Um, and I 100% agree with you. So I think, you know, you're certainly appropriate to be managing these patients in an acute area. In the era of COVID, thinking about ISO uh, until you have a better sense as to whether they're going to need airway manipulation, but certainly in an acute care area, whether it's trauma, whether, like you said, it's a blue bed. I like that you're calling for help. I like that you're getting, you know, RT some experience in the room. Um, definitely having them bring the trach tray, having them bring the trach change box, suction, oxygen and a variety of masks, LMAs, endotracheal tubes. I think those are all excellent things. Um, so 100% agree with that. So we'll move on. I can just cut in for one second, Danielle. It's Kathy Roth here. Um, I just, I do want to emphasize to the group here about the importance of protecting yourself in the era of COVID with these tracheostomy patients, because although we know that the the things that we do are aerosol generating like intubation and other things um tracheostomies really can have projectile um coughing and it can go a long ways and so you know that that sort of like distancing thing is amplified um significantly by a tracheostomy and i think you know face shields and then goggles even protecting your eyes uh, if you don't have a face shield on, but even if you do, um, it would be very reasonable if you're dealing with a patient who has a tracheostomy because they can really project that from their lungs. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a, an excellent point and I appreciate you bringing it up. Certainly in the era of COVID, I think erring on the side of negative pressure room and full PPE, uh, at least until you have a sense of what's going on, is entirely appropriate. Uh, thanks, Sid, and thank you, Dr. Roth. Um, so we'll move on now that we've, again, got a basic approach, we've got our room set up, we'll, and we'll move to specific trach complications. And so I've divided these into what I think are emergent complications in that, you know, we as emerge are going to have to start managing these patients, life or limb uh, type situations before we have specialist involvement. And then we'll talk at the end about a few urgent complications that we need to be recognizing and assisting with workup that will ultimately sort of be more worked up by our ENT colleagues. And so the emerging complications we'll touch on today are going to be decannulation, obstruction, and bleeding. And we'll start with decannulation. And so for those uh, who may not be familiar with the word, essentially the bottom line is the trach is out. And whether, you know, usually these are inadvertent, uh, could be a patient pulling it out, could fall out, could be a recurrence of a cancer pushing that trach out. But for whatever reason, that trach is supposed to be in is not. <laughs> so certainly can, could be a complication, as I'm sure we can understand. So the approach to decannulation, uh, the two big questions we're going to ask, in addition to those five other questions, but the two big decision points for us is how stable is our patient and how old is that trach? And so this is the algorithm we'll walk through and we'll go through it step by step. Um, and so the first steps in all of these algorithms are going to be the same. And it's going to be applying supplemental oxygen by face mask, that O2 IV monitor that we do for every patient and calling for help. And I think involving our specialist colleagues, involving our RTs early in these patients, or at least notifying our specialist colleagues these patients exist and or are having difficulties um, is really important because not only do they bring a wealth of expertise and experience, um, they also bring equipment, they have access to ORs for the ult you know, ultimate management of these patients. And so getting them involved early, making them aware of these patients and, uh, and starting that ball rolling, I think can't be overemphasized. Um, and then that first divider is how stable is your patient? Are they oxygenating and ventilating? And so some patients will decannulate themselves and, and they may be stable. If they have a patent airway and a patent stoma, they may be able to oxygenate and ventilate. In which case, I think it's entirely reasonable to, for us to support that patient, for us to provide supplemental O2 and at least get the, involve, the advice uh, or involvement of our 
colleagues and whether that's most likely that's going to be ENT uh, but if for, for some reason thoracics is already involved with that patient they may be the uh, reasonable consult service. Stenosis of a stoma site can happen within 8 to 12 hours and so if the trach's been out for a long period of time they may need some dilation to put it back in and so I think we can certainly do more more bad than good by trying to manipulate a patient um, who is un, who is stable for the moment. So I think closely observing them and supporting them is entirely reasonable. And at least speaking to our colleagues on the phone and getting a sense as to what their ETA might be. Um, if they're gonna, you know, if they're scrubbing in for a case and they're gonna be several hours and the patient's stable, then it might be reasonable to discuss with RT the comfort level with replacing that trach. Um, but certainly, you know, there's no rush to go ahead and, and start doing things. For an unstable patient, obviously that's gonna be different. And while we're still alerting our specialist colleagues early, um, we want to, we're going to have to start managing the patient. And so if this is an immature trait, which again, I think is very unlikely for us to see in the emergency department, but uh, still reasonable to consider. So in an immature trait, we're going to likely have to manage the airway from above, assuming that we have reason to believe it's patent. So they're not a laryngectomy patient. We'll talk about that a little bit at the end. But if they're a chronic mechanical ventilation patient, we're going to manage that airway from above using the skills that we are more comfortable with. Um, but the big thing that I would emphasize here is that any patient with a trach, regardless of how patent you think their upper airway is, is going to be a potentially difficult airway. And so approaching it as such, making sure that you have plans A, B, and C, making sure you have a surgical airway tray available to you, that you have at least assessed and prepped the neck, um, position the patient well. And so, you know, working on your optimal positioning for intubation, most experienced operator, these patients, regardless of the reason for their tracheostomy, should be considered a difficult airway and really respected in that manner. So that's for our immature trachs. Really um, would be unlikely that we would be trying to see these patients in the first place, but also very, um, very suboptimal if we have to try to ma manipulate the airway from the neck. We should be trying to intubate these patients from above, but obviously getting our specialist colleagues involved early. For an unstable patient with a mature trach, it changes a little bit and we have some more options. So the first option would be to potentially try to recannulate that trach. And certainly in a mature tract, that might be uh, entirely reasonable. In the eMERGE, we have the MBA scope. And so in, um, recannulating under direct visualization or through the use of a bougie might be reasonable. Certainly our RT colleagues do this much more frequently than we do when they do trach changes in uh, ICU. So getting their advice, you know, positioning our patient, so roll under the shoulders, getting that neck and extension optimizing our visualization with good lighting. Certainly reasonable to try to recannulate some of these patients. Many of them could potentially even recannulate themselves, and if, but if they haven't, uh, reasonable for us to give it a try. However, I would say, um, and thank you to Dr. Luckett, I don't know if she's listening in right at the moment, but for the analogy, I think you know our approach to recannulating these patients should be similar to our approach for catheterizing a trauma patient, where we would make one attempt, we would be gentle and we would you know, do our best, but I think if we're meeting resistance, if we think we're in the wrong place, if we're causing bleeding or any other local trauma, we should be stopping and moving to the other side of that, uh, of that algorithm, which is managing the airway from above, um, as long as we think it's reasonable to do so. Because I think blindly, uh, forcefully trying to insert that trach, uh, we could cause much more, much more trouble than we are alleviating. Danielle, if I can put a plug in for, um... If you're going to do one attempt at putting it back in, the, the importance of getting a shoulder roll in underneath that patient and really bringing, bringing their neck into extension so that that, that deep hole becomes, you know, a uh, better position to actually see what you're doing. A light or a headlight and um, a couple extra pairs of hands, one to run the suction and one to put a, a single hook up in the skin or a retractor uh, or a couple of retractors to expose that for you is gonna really increase your success rate of getting that back in, okay? So I think I can't speak enough to the value of positioning, even it, you know, it only takes a few extra seconds really to get that shoulder roll under them and it can make a world of difference when you're doing a cr emergency crike as well, um, or if you're trying to recannulate them. Yeah, that's great. I think that's a phenomenal point. Something we should be doing for all of our difficult, well, all of our airways in the first place is positioning, but certainly for something like this, especially if it's an unfamiliar skill, um, you know, putting yourself in the best uh, position to succeed is important. <laughs> 
this the one special scenario we'll talk about and i think i've alluded to it already is those patients where we know that they will not have a patent upper airway and so specifically they may be our laryngectomy patients where there is no communication between the upper uh, the nasopharynx or pharynx and the trachea where there would normally be so in our normal scenarios we can intubate from above they may be difficult they may have a mass um, but we assume that there is still some patent track there, but in specifically the laryngectomy patients, but also those obstructed patients, we can expect that we're not gonna be able to pass an endotracheal tube from above. And in those scenarios, we're gonna to have to manage the patient via their stoma. And that's the reality. It's not something we'll be hugely comfortable with. It may not be something that we've done before, but we have to treat this as their only airway. Um, and it's coming out the anterior neck, applying oxygen to their face, to their mouth is not going to make a huge difference. I think we should still be doing it. We should be applying oxygen to every orifice on the off chance there's some patency there. But uh, in these laryngectomy specifically patients, we need to be managing them through the stoma. And so we can bag the stoma. We can use a pediatric LMA or a pediatric bag mask for the stoma site. Uh, we could try passing, I think as Sid mentioned, having some small endotracheal tubes in the room in case you don't have a replacement trach, and that's entirely reasonable, passing a small endotracheal tube with a cuff uh, through that stoma to try to secure an airway it is entirely reasonable. And this is where, you know, one of those big tenets that, uh, of your hist history is really, really important is, well, what is the likelihood that they have a patent upper airway? In a laryngectomy, that's zero. In some of these upper airway obstructions, we could certainly try one attempt from above, but we have to anticipate that that may fail. And if it does fail, we need to manage, um, manage from the anterior neck or the anterior chest. The second emergent complication I want to chat about is obstruction, um, and this is potentially relatively common depending on, you know, why the trachs incite you, but certainly lots of secretions, um, any bleeding could cause clotting, and we, I know, discussed yesterday uh, at Airway Day a case of an obstructed trach that sounds <laughs> gut-wrenching. Um, so certainly it's a, a potentially high-risk time for a trach patient, and so the big divide here is actually going to be how stable is your patient. And so you'll hear a common refrain, the first step of all of these algorithms is the same, is applying oxygen to every, um, to every potential airway. So oxygen to the face, oxygen to the stoma um, or the tracheostomy site, calling for help. Um, so getting our RT colleagues on their way down to bring their equipment, but also notifying our ENT colleagues and then assessing the patient and how stable are they and are they oxygenating and ventilating. And so if that's the case, then again, you know, I think there's, it's entirely reasonable for us to speak with you speak with our colleagues on the phone, support that patient's airway, apply oxygen, um, and you know, not mess with the small patent airway that they have. It's a, clearly a partial obstruction. Um, and it, as long as they're not tiring out, I think it's reasonable to wait. However, if the patient is unstable or they appear to be tiring out, you know, increasing stride or work of breathing, decreasing LOC, then obviously we need to move on to assess the trach um, while we're waiting for special support. And so the it's going to be a stepwise approach and after each step we should be reassessing that tracheostomy um, to look for patency. Waveform capnography can really help us with this because and I think we discussed this at airway rounds yesterday as well. Uh, pulse ox lag is a real thing and so we may not see any improvement in our pulse ox for up to 20 seconds after we make a change whereas our waveform capnography can really give us a sense as to whether we're adequately ventilating our patients. So having inline waveform capnography can really support some of these uh, some of these interventions, but the first step will be to remove this speaking valve uh, or cap. And so this may be, you know, the patient may call it a passimere, but essentially what it is is a one-way valve that blocks the end of the trach so that air can be entrained. So when the patient generates negative pressure, or this could be on a ventilator in some situations, so when positive pressure pushes air through, the air is allowed to be entrained into the chest, but when air attempts to leave, the valve closes and forces that air up through the uh, upper airway and allows the patient to generate sounds and speak. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a valve, it's a form of obstruction. And so removing that from the equation is the first step and reassessing your patient. Uh, unlikely that this has fixed your, your issue, but certainly that would be the first step. And you're reassessing, if you haven't cleared your obstruction, you move to your next step. And so in any trach, again, the majority of what we will see will have the inner cannula. And so removing that inner cannula will be the next step and it may be that that cannula is blocked and the patient can breathe just fine or be ventilated just fine through their patent outer cannula. So remove the inner cannula, assess it for obstruction um, and reassess your patient. If that is not able to clear your obstruction then we have to um, attempt to pass a suction catheter and so the small flexible suction catheters can be inserted 
a couple of um, tips and tricks with this, again, mostly from our from our RT colleagues who do this quite frequently in the ICU, is that you know you are introducing a form of obstruction when you introduce that suction catheter, and so don't be afraid. The patient will likely cough, and they may desat while you're doing that. Ensure that someone either you or someone else should be stabilizing uh, the tracheostomy while you're doing this so that you don't dislodge it. And warning the patient, you know, if the patient is conscious, warning them that you're about to do this, it's quite a noxious thing to do to someone. So warning them that you're about to do it, do it deliberately, make deep passes um, and, and pull out with sort of a twisting motion to really try to clear those secretions. And again, our RT colleagues would be a great uh, resource to help us with this. But ultimately, um, you'll get a sense as to whether you can pass that suction catheter. And if you can't, then you have to assume that that trach is likely obstructed itself and not functioning as a patent airway. In which case you could deflate the cuff of that trach if, if it is a cuff trach and supply oxygen from above. And that could be positive pressure with a BVM or could be passive uh, with a non-rebreather. And then again, at every step we're reassessing the uh, adequacy of our ventilation and oxygenation. If at this point you've not uh, been able to uh, Sid's asking, is that suction catheter found in the trach change kit or where would we obtain that? So yes, there is a suction catheter in the trach change kit um, and there are also ones in recess as well at the head of the bed that the RTs have access to and so the RTs would be the best person to ask for that. Uh, it's just a suction attachment. So at this point, there's also, um, there are also tube exchangers in that kit there are. Um, that are the right size to fit into a, a tracheostomy tube. Um, I just wonder if I could stop you for one second, Danielle, just to Please. talk for a minute about the use of pulse oximetry in um, assessing the patient. Um, because, uh, you know, having seen um, upper airway obstructions and how they progress, we actually tend not to um, put much reliability on the oxygen saturation. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is that you can imagine that it's it's going to be fine until it isn't. <laughs> and um, because it's, it's a different sort of process, right? We're not, you know, their lungs might be oxygenating absolutely fine and so their, their levels are good, but as the swelling progresses or the bleeding or the degree of obstruction, they'll, they'll suddenly just drop their sats like very, very quickly. So I wouldn't um, take that as a clinical sign to be reassured necessarily. Um, if you think you're dealing with an upper airway obstruction of some sort. Um, I think, um, you know, positioning of the patient, their work of breathing, the amount of air they're actually moving and, and the sounds that they're making are probably much more indicative than your pulse oximetry, which will, and we know this from in the OR when we watch patients, um, you know, that are, you know, cannot intubate, cannot ventilate, cannot intubate patients. They're, their stats are fine and then then they drop like a stone so i just mm -hmm. want to make sure that people aren't putting too much stock in that because that can be a real pitfall as well that you just be suspicious when that you might be dealing with an upper airway obstruction absolutely yeah i know i think that's a entirely uh, appropriate com appropriate comment and um and certainly and i think like you said, the clinical uh, pieces are going to be a big part of how we assess these patients. And I think waveform capnography can also give us a really good real-time sense as to what, you know, whether we are at a, whether we are ventilating uh, these patients. But 100% agree with you that pulse ox should not be, uh, you know, a reassuring, a normal pulse ox reading should not be reassuring because it represents their oxygenation 20 seconds ago, first of all, but also, like you said, can be completely normal until it's too late. Um, so thank you for, for reinforcing that. Um, so at this point, we've reached a point where we feel that that trach is not patent, not functioning. And so um, this part, I think, would have the biggest sort of cognitive difficulty for me is removing that trach and actually managing the airway in a different manner. And so if this is a patent upper airway patient intubating from above and, and uh, putting up a cuff in the endotracheal tube um, would be reasonable. If it's a laryngectomy patient, then we may need to use a small endotracheal tube uh, through the stoma to do that. And so again, I will just want to reinforce these are difficult airways by definition. Um, but once we, you know, if we have an endotracheal tube in, then all of a sudden we're in our obstructed airway algorithm that we're all familiar with. You know, if a four-year-old chokes on Lego, we know how to intubate them. We know how to pass into the right main stem and try to try to mobilize or clear that obstruction. And so 
you know, in a sense, this may be more where we're comfortable, but I think that cognitive barrier to removing what we thought was a patent airway and uh, trying to replace it can be really, really difficult. Um, but making sure that we have difficult airway uh, equipment available, that we have a good plan, most experienced operator, and having a surgical airway tray in the room, having, you know, mark and prep the neck and be prepared to perform a surgical airway in these patients because they may not be intubatable from above. And depending on you know what their stoma is, how what we're able to pass, um, I think just having that low uh, low threshold for considering these very very difficult airways. I want to make a little plug, and this came up in airway rounds yesterday as well. Uh, a little plug for these uh, two flow charts. They're from a UK collaborative guideline uh, in the Journal of Anesthesia, published in 2012, and they walk you through essentially what we've talked about so far as far as the emergency management for a patent upper airway on the left in the green and a laryngectomy or you know, non-patent upper airway uh, patient on the right in the red. And I think, um, you know, certainly if, if I put you to sleep already, um, this might be a good refresher moving forward for some of these emergencies. And I know Mason, I'm not sure if he's on the call right now, but Mason spoke yesterday about how ICU is gonna, or just trying to do a better job of labeling um, patients or making it clear in their documentation which algorithm they would fall into and whether that's a bracelet while they're in hospital, whether that's a sign on the end of the bed or on the door, um, to make sure that it's abundantly clear to anyone who's having to emergently manage these patients, whether they have a patent airway, upper airway or not. So these, um, what this guideline actually advocated for was having these signs posted on the end of the bed so that any patient, could, any person could walk in, pick up the sign and know how to work through this patient's management. And for the laryngectomy patients, you know, accepting that you're not going to be able to manage them from above and sort of bypassing the attempts there and uh, moving forward. So the final of the uh, three compli emergent complications I want to talk about is bleeding. So bleeding from a trach site, um, you know, can be very underwhelming or it could be alarming depending on the volume and the quantity and, um, and the patient's clinical scenario. Um, but there's one thing that sort of we all, or at least I think many of us have a knee-jerk response, and we all think about when we see bleeding from a trach. And Rob, so trope, what would what would you be most worried about? What's the big, bad, ugly thing that we want to rule out? Uh, probably a tracheonominate fistula. Absolutely. Perfect. Um, so TIF for tracheonominate fistula. Oh, thanks, Dr. Rob. Um, so TIF or tracheonominate fistula is the big, bad, and the ugly thing. Bleeding from a trach site it can be quite common. Up to 6% of patients will have this. But TIFs are very rare. And essentially what happens is when we think about the anatomy of the neck, the trachea lies just posterior to the aortic arch and in quite close proximity to the innominate artery. And when the cuff is inflated, and certainly in the era when we had higher pressure cuffs, having uh, high pressure in that cuff or local infection or malignancy or some sort of erosion um, could cause a patent uh, tract between the trachea and the artery. And I don't think, I think most of us can understand why that's a really, um, really bad scenario for the patient it, for a number of reasons. Having, you know, a tr patent tract between an airway and a high pressure artery coming off the aortic arch um, gives a lot of opportunity for bleeding and a lot of opportunity for blood in the airway and these patients can go south really really quickly fortunately it's becoming less and less common um, but these patients can be a little deceiving in that they can present with what we call a sentinel bleed and they can come in with a small amount of bleeding from their trach which then resolves and looks very unalarming overall but unfortunately it can be the sentinel bleed that, um, that forecasts a, a pending Cat catastrophic bleed and Dr. Roth was kind enough to share some stories last last night while we were speaking about uh, some of these and the significance of the bleeding you know I think can't be understated with these very rare fistulas and so this is the big bad and ugly thing that we need to be ruling out before these patients leave the department and if I leave you with nothing else today I hope um, that you'll know that every patient who comes with bleeding from their trach site needs to be seen and scoped by ENT before they leave the eMERGE department so these are not patients where you say oh it was a tiny bit of bleeding they're probably fine and send them off to be followed as an outpatient. These patients should be seen and assessed uh, in the department before they leave. Um, and thank you to Dr. Roth for, for some of that advice as well. So we'll go through an approach to a bleeding trach because you know the majority of these patients will not have a TIF, but that's the big thing that we're looking to rule out. And so we'll again ask ourselves how stable is the patient and how severe is the bleeding. And this is the algorithm that we'll walk through. And so the first step is the same, is that oxygen uh, 
to the face and mouth, as well as to the neck, calling for help. You know, we know that ENT has to see these patients before they leave. And so giving them a heads up, this patient's in the department and will need to be seen, uh, again, helps them to, to plan and to come, come when they can. If the bleeding is not severe, so if it's a small amount of bleeding, just a trickle or some, uh, a little bit of bleeding with suctioning, then in speaking with our ENT colleagues, we can talk about ordering a CT angio, and then ultimately they'll need to be scoped. So CT angio, assuming the patient is stable um, and is, is safe to go to CT, can be performed and gives us a sense of where that bleeding source is, or at least helps us to rule out a TIF. And then our ENT colleagues are able to scope, look, uh, directly visualize the interior of that trach and as well as the trachea, and get a sense as to whether this is some bleeding granulation tissue uh, or what have you. Again, it gets a bit more exciting as we go down the severely bleeding. So these patients could be hemorrhaging from their trach site, could be uh, coughing up quite significant amounts of blood. And so in that case, we'll go through a systematic sort of algorithm to try to temporize these patients to get, to, get them to the OR. And ultimately what they're going to need is a midline sternotomy um, to try to fix this bleeding and 50% of the patients who make it that far, so we're able to be stabilized enough to get to the OR, are still going to die. And so this is, like I said, a catastrophic bleeding complication from a trait. Um, so again, we need to have a high index of suspicion. So the first step is actually to hyperinflate the cuff of the trach. And obviously this is assuming that you have a cuff trach in situ. So hyperinflating that cuff will hopefully put a bit of pressure on that innominate artery, stop that bleeding and temporize things. You can use a cuff pressure transducer to, to make sure that you don't pop the cuff. And the documentation for each trach will tell you uh, maximum volumes that you can put in. And our RTs are a valuable resource to help us there as well. You could consider instilling lidocaine with epinephrine at this point, either spraying it or instilling a bit down the tube just to get yourself some anesthesia as well as potentially some vasoconstriction to help with visualization. If you're unable to, you know, if the bleeding is so copious that you're unable to uh, control it at that point, while the trachs incite you, you can attempt to put your finger through the stoma. And so hopefully uh, you've got someone working with you who's got small fingers, who's able to pass their finger through the stoma and try to control that bleeding with direct pressure. And whether it's pinching um, anteriorly towards the sternum, so pinching between your finger and the sternum, or whether it's pinching between your thumb and your uh, index finger to try to get the bleeding controlled uh, would be the next step. With no success uh, at that point, Likely what we're gonna to have to do is insert an endotracheal tube and whether we intubate from above or in a laryngectomy patient into, uh, intubating the stoma, again, trying to use that cuff to control that bleeding. Uh, and again, to secure the airway and ensure that further bleeding into the airway is not ongoing. And then Dr. Roth was kind enough to point out that you can also pack around uh, that endotracheal tube. So vag packing, ribbon gauze, whatever it is that you may have, again, to provide some pressure and tampon out that bleeding. Once you have an airway established, you can then, again, do what you can to temporize this patient to get them to the OR. With the endotracheal tube in situ, you can again use your finger to try to apply pressure. And so um, these are dramatic bleeds. And so you may be riding with the patient to the OR if you do get some local control. But um, again, these patients are really sick. The mortality is quite high, even if we are able to stabilize them enough to get them to the operating room. So I just want to reinforce that every patient who is bleeding in any way from a trach site is going to need to be seen by ENT at some point and scoped before they leave the department. And if it's copious amounts of bleeding, obviously sooner rather than later. So at this point, we've covered the three sort of what I would call emergent complications of trachs. And I just want to stop here really quickly and see if we, there are any questions that came up. I saw a couple of comments arise. So I'm just going to maybe see if I can pull those up. If there aren't questions, we'll uh, move on into the urgent complications. I do have a question, Danielle. Oh, sorry. Yeah, of course. I can't get my cursor to leave my uh, presentation page to open the chat. So if you posted there, I didn't see it. I'm sorry. No worries. Um, I have a question about a unique scenario. I don't know if this was covered in airway rounds yesterday because Mason was at the case, but it was a challenging scenario because the patient was post-op day one trach dilation. So it wasn't uh, an immature tract per se, but it was immature in the sense that there had recently been a procedure. The patient had decannulated herself and was very agitated and there were no SATs available. So the patient was unstable. Um, and so it was very difficult to manage. And it was a situation where going above wouldn't be ideal. And um, there was subglottic stenosis, vocal cord paralysis, and, and you knew that there was a recent procedure. And the obstruction was actually below 
from bleeding and essentially a clot ball valving at the carina. So you have a decannulization and an obstruction below the level of the trach. So I was wondering if from maybe Dr. Roth can help, if there are any tips or tricks in that scenario where, you know, the patient was in a monitored setting, we were trying everything from oxygenating above, trying to suction um, that clot out using a meconium aspirator, trying to do whatever we could and essentially use ketamine and a very small ET tube, what we could get down because Shiley's and other things couldn't go um, through that trach site, um, which was pretty stenotic, um, and trying to bag while the patient was taking breast voluntarily with ketamine. Um, any tips or tricks, Dr. Roth, in, in that kind of situation? Um, ENT was in the OR, uh, kindly sent down a resident to help us, but still we had to temporize for quite a bit of time. Yeah, I mean, it sounds to me like you made the right decisions with the with the equipment that you had available, and we can see that, especially with those fresh trachs, that there there's just enough oozing that the bleeding kind of trickles down, trickles down, and and starts to create a big clot, like a cast almost of the trachea and even of the bronchus, and and you know. Um, the, the, those situations are obviously rare, and I think trying to get something past that or to the side of it so that you can ventilate. So a small endotracheal tube makes a lot of sense to me as well. Um, ultimately, uh, did that patient go to the OR then? Or how? Yeah, how yes, that it tried to get any form of bronch down there. It was uh, a little bit of a logistical nightmare, but in the end, um, we ended up taking the patient to the OR. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, and I have actually needed to um, actually grasp the clot with forceps and pull it, pull those out. They can look very formed, almost like a cast of the uh, of the airway. So yeah, um, bronchoscopy is also um, you know uh, a great option because then you can suction as well at the same time. Um, but that doesn't get set up right away. So it sounds to me like you did the right thing, trying to intubate past it until we could, you know, see what was going on in the OR. Okay, thanks for those suggestions. Yeah, and, and Julie, that was certainly the consensus. That, that case was presented airway rounds yesterday, um, and that was the consensus was that the right steps were taken. Like it's a mm -hmm. Nightmare airway from the sounds of things. It was, it was very, very scary. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was the consensus yesterday from our, uh, I guess it was emerge, emerge anesthesia and uh, and ICU uh, consensus was that they, no one would have done anything too, too much differently. Um, so we'll move on then quickly and talk very quickly about a couple of urgent complications, really things that we should just be keeping an eye out for in trach patients coming to the emergency department. Um, and the three we'll talk briefly about are tracheoesophageal fistula, tracheostenosis, and infection. Tracheoesophageal fistula, you know, we've already talked about one form of fistula. This one's a little bit less critical, um, but essentially you're seeing a patency uh, between the trachea and the esophagus. And, you know, historically this was caused by high cuff pressures, which is uh, not a feature of, of current trachs quite so much, um, but certainly could still be seen with local infection or erosion from a tumor, et cetera. Um, these can present pretty insidious, insidiously in pediatrics. It can be as simple as failure to thrive, uh, could be increasing shortness of breath, recurrent aspiration of food. Certainly the contents of either, uh, of either column could end up in the other. So uh, distension of the stomach with air and then aspiration of food products from the esophagus uh, could, be, could be visible. And so getting our uh, specialist colleagues involved in coordinating with them to get some imaging uh, likely of the esophagus, so some sort of contrast esophagography and or CT scan of the mediastinum will be necessary to identify these. And again, that won't necessarily be our decision to make in eMERGE, but having a th low threshold for considering this and recognizing these in our patients when they can present pretty insidiously uh, would be important. Tracheal stenosis, um, so we all know the word stenosis means a narrowing, and so that can occur at the site of the cuff. That can occur at the site of the stoma. Um, again, something that's important to be thinking about and recognizing, uh, and recognizing that most patients will actually have some level of stenosis, but only about 12, three to 12 percent will become symptomatic. But you can actually tolerate quite a significant stenosis before you develop symptoms, and so the um, literature that I was reading was saying that up to 10 millimeters 
of patent airway, you may have no symptoms. At about 10 millimeters, you may get some exertional dyspnea. And about five millimeters, which is really a pinhole of an airway, uh, is when you're gonna start getting uh, shortness of breath at rest and or strider. And so recognizing that a patient coming in where they are at the point where they're stridulous or in uh, respiratory distress may have a pinhole of an air airway and may not tolerate much from a manip manipulation perspective. Um, and so supporting these patients, if they're maintaining their airway uh, and thinking about the things we do for other narrowed airways. So the things we do for croup and other things, uh, you know, supporting their airway, positioning them head of the bed elevated uh, in a position of comfort for them thinking about providing inhaled bronchodilators or racemic epinephrine, again, to temporize them. Uh, there's some discussion as to whether Heliox may be beneficial, although I think there's no strong evidence, but using our, our skills in that manner to temporize these patients until they can be seen uh, by a surgical service and, and supported, and whether they need stenting or, um, or debridement of, of the granulation tissue that's causing that stenosis. Uh, either way, you know, our job, I think, is to keep them stable and supported and appreciating that if we do have to intubate these patients, uh, going down a size in an endotracheal tube and anticipating them to be a difficult airway can be really important. And then finally, I just want to briefly touch on airway infection. Trach patients are at high risk for infection, uh, anywhere from the stoma site right down into the lungs, mediastinum, um, pneumonias, soft tissue infections. You know, they're, they're at risk for a number of reasons that trach bypasses many of their uh, natural upper airway immune responses, but also, you know, they may be chronically ventilated, prone to ventilator associated pneumonias. They may have spent prolonged periods of time in the hospital and have uh, ex many exposures to resistant organisms, or they may be immunocompromised as a result of their malignancy or the chemotherapy and so be at risk for atypical organisms. So having, again, a high threshold uh, or sorry, low threshold to think about these complications and image our patients appropriately, consult appropriately, and, uh, and treat them appropriately with broad spectrum antibiotics as necessary. Um, again, it's just a chest x-ray to illustrate a low bar pneumonia in a trach patient, but also to talk a little bit about looking at a trach on chest x-ray. And so ideally, unfortunately, this one's a little bit rotated as many, many chest x-rays are, but looking at at the tip of the tracheostomy tube should be approximately halfway between the stomacyte and the carina. Um, the width of the tube should be no more than sort of two thirds of the tracheal width and the cuff, if present, should not be distending or distorting the trachea in any way. And then finally, and I think this is probably evident, uh, the, the tube should lie parallel to the trachea. And if it's not, that's probably a big problem. Um, so that's, so we'll just finish off coming back to Fred and I won't torture any more of the juniors by, uh, taking them through this case because we're running out of time and I want to leave some time for questions. But so trach to remind you is our 54 year old gentleman with ALS who's chronically ventilated via his tracheostomy, who's coming in with some small scant blood from his trach for two days and is now feeling that it's partially blocked. Uh, fortunately, you attended this talk or you are an expert at trachs and so you uh, pulled out the inner cannula and found it to be quite blocked. And once the inner cannula is out, his obstructive symptoms seem to resolve. Um, but you did see quite a bit of uh, bleeding and clot in that uh, inner cannula, and therefore you involved our ENT colleagues who, uh, fortunately, he was stable enough at this point for CT angio that ruled out TIF, uh, and they were able to scope and found some bleeding granulation tissue, um, and they were uh, kind enough to assist us with management moving forward. So hopefully just a case to bring together some of those parts of different algorithms and recognizing that patients may have one or more uh, issues, they may become obstructed and then decannulate themselves uh, I think similar to, to Julie's case there uh, in an attempt to clear their obstruction. And so recognizing that, you know, patients don't fall in clear, into clear cut categories in most of most cases. So at this point, I just want to leave you hopefully with four thoughts. Um, and if you remember nothing else from our uh, discussion today, hopefully you can, you'll remember to call for help early with these patients and get, you know, experienced trach operators, uh, trach manipulators in the room uh, and have them bring both their expertise, but also their equipment. Make sure that you're differentiating your stable from unstable patients. And our stable patients, I think less is more in many of these patients and manipulation of the trach by an unexperienced operator may be more detrimental than helpful. Um, apply oxygen to all airway access points for these patients. You don't know what's patent when you're first assessing them. And so I think it's entirely reasonable um, you know, to, to consider that uh, their upper airway may be patent. And finally, all bleeding patients get scoped before they leave the department. So if I leave you with those four things, hopefully that's uh, enough. And at this point, again, if there are more questions, I'd be more than happy to uh, address those. And uh, thank you to Dr. Roth. Uh, I think Dr. Luckett had to step away, but uh, to Dr. Roth and I think to Christina, one of the ENT residents who was kind enough to uh, listen in and provide some guidance.
And if, you'll have to buzz in if you have questions because for some reason I can't open the chat. <laughs> If I could just make a comment, Danielle, first of all, great presentation and like an excellent overview of, of the kind of common presentations that you might see in the emergency room. So just a, uh, just a great job. And I said that when I saw your talk first as well. I just wanted to comment on just the tracheal stenosis for a minute, if I could, um, and, and why, why patients are able to tolerate that when they're not able to tolerate the bleeding or the the narrowing from like you know edema or a tumor and the, and the reason is that the stenosis develops so gradually that they're able to to compensate for that um, over a longer period of time so you know even though they may be actually more narrow than someone with a tumor or or someone with the, you know other obstructive type of picture um, it's happened over such a gradual period of time that they've been able to compensate somewhat for that. And that's why you probably don't see those patients as often, okay? Um, but, uh, and then in the OR, what we actually do usually would be to dilate it if it's not so extremely narrowed, um, either with a bougie or we have a balloon as well that we can, can use, but usually it's bougies. Um, but sometimes these patients are so narrow that they actually need a tracheal resection and reconstruction. Um, and that's, you know, especially things like, you know, a pediatric um, trauma to the, to the airway or a previous tracheostomy that has become narrowed or previous long-term ventilation. Those are the kind of pictures where we can see that, that sort of extreme subglottic stenosis. So I just wanted to make a comment about that. No, that's, that's it's not that common, so. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I managed to get access to the chat, and I can see there's a question from Julie saying, uh, asking if there are ideal agents for topical bleeding around a trach. Um, you know, surgical, I guess that surgical therapy, TXA. Um, do you want to see, oh, Surgicel, that makes sense, okay. Um, do you want to be seeing patients who are bleeding superficially, I guess, visibly from their, um, from their trach site? I guess that maybe Dr. Roth or Christina. Yeah, I mean, if it's a, we, we see this uh, with fresh trachs that you can get bleeding from a skin edge or just in underneath the skin, um, which can be, you know, problematic, obviously. Um, and like I said, that slow trickle, if some of that is going down and going around that trach site, that can be problematic as well. But if it's just at the, at the opening or just below the skin, Surgicel works great because you can kind of lay that in there and it'll usually create a clot. Um, sometimes it needs to have actually something cauterized there as well. Um, so, you know, we would probably use a bipolar in that situation or silver nitrate cautery. Um, and that's what Christina has said too, so that's good. <laughs> um, so I'm glad she's doing that. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and uh, you know, don't, hesitate to call us either because you know it's it's probably going to be one of our patients <laughs> so um we're going to want to know about it anyway so you know don't feel like you have to manage that um on your own either great uh one last question or just a question i have here um just in the uk algorithm that uh was passed around yesterday um, in terms of you know if you if you've gone down the algorithm you've pulled out an obstructed trach and now you're either ventilating uh, via the face or via the stoma. Um, in terms of just practically doing that ventilating via the stoma, would you not have to occlude the mouth uh, somehow, or at least uh, PVM uh, apply a seal up top in order to actually uh, have the breath delivered via the stoma versus just kind of uh, passing out of the mouth? So. Uh, are you saying if a trach tube is in place or not in place? So yeah, so let's say it was like obstructed and you've had to withdraw the trach and now you're just trying to provide like emergency oxygenation via the stoma site. Um, I, I'm assuming you have to apply like a BVM face mask to occlude the nose and mouth to provide a successful breath then? Um, or do you find that, you know, uh, you can still successfully provide breaths without having to occlude the nose? You probably should, I guess. I, I mean, I guess, hmm, 
I think I would be trying to intubate that patient or to put an endotracheal tube into the tracheal stoma and get a cuff in there. And that's really the best way you're gonna have effective ventilation. I don't know how effective your ventilation is gonna be through a, um, a stoma site that doesn't have a tube in that is collapsed anyway. So um, I, you know, I, I don't have the algorithm in front. Oh, I guess I do have the algorithm in front of me. Thanks, Daniel. <laughs> but um, I would say I would move through that step fairly quickly because it, it's probably going to be very ineffective. I, I, I really can't see how, how that would work very well. Um, so you know, I guess I would go back to applying oxygen with whatever orifice you can, and maybe not blocking off any, um, but really moving more quickly to the idea of of either trying to intubate from above if it's a, a trach patient or to get something into that um, tracheostoma or laryngostoma with a cuff. Thank you. All right, well, it's officially 12.01 by my uh, stove clock, so I will uh, thank, thank you again to everyone for tuning in. Um, and uh, obviously to Dr. Roth and to Christina for providing ENT perspective on things, to Dr. Luckett, who I think had to step away for helping me prep, and Emery and Justine as well. So thank you all and uh, have a lovely afternoon. Great job, Danielle. Thank you, thanks for having me. Thanks, no, I really appreciate you uh, tuning in and helping with some of the questions. Really appreciate it. Nice to see everyone, take care.